Good afternoon, professors. And I'm Daitri Diwari. And on behalf of Bill Institute of Management Technology, I take this pleasure to welcome you to our first special lecture of our faculty development program on future roadmap uh, for management education. This special session has been framed on implications of national education policy 2020 uh, for Indian higher education. And uh, we herald that uh, as a leading B school with the category one autonomy by AICT, BIMTEC has been committed to adoption of NEP. So our first lectoral on the educational policy was held back in uh, on 16th of September, 2020 by Dr. R.P. Singh. Uh, who's the Secretary General of Quality Council of India, and we discussed about future of quality assurance and accreditation in Indian higher education. So with COVID changing the fabric of higher education across the globe, we are grateful today to have Dr. Furkan Kamar uh, to discuss the implications of NEP 2020. It is serendipity, and it is my good fortune uh, to introduce you to Dr. Kamar because uh, it is with his address that I commenced my association with BIMTEC. So as a research scholar, when I joined Wimtech in 2019, uh, he addressed us as the chief guest during the induction of the fellow program in management of uh, the 2019 batch. And uh, I strikingly remember that uh, he, in fact, refused to be introduced uh, while we were having the talk. And that was a great message of humility that I carried from his address. Uh, but nonetheless, I take this opportunity to formally introduce you uh, to our uh, fraternity here. So Dr. Kamar is presently Professor of Management at the Center of Management Studies, Jamia Millia Islamia, New Delhi. He has served as the Secretary General of the Association of Indian Universities, the largest and one of the oldest network of universities in the world. Uh, in his illustrious career, Dr. Kamar has held the position of Vice Chancellor of the University of Rajasthan and the Central University of Himachal Pradesh. Uh, he has also served as advisor education in the Planning Commission of India. Uh, a professor of management, he has keen research interest in public policy, planning, administration and financing of higher education and has numerous publications in journals of repute to his credit. Professor has chaired and been members of a large number of committees, working groups at the national as well as international level. And uh, he thus brings with him uh, an academic eminence uh, for work groups at uh, different levels. And his exposure to best global practices uh, are the key ingredients for BIMTEC to reinvent itself, to face the new normal, and reimagine the future of management education. May I now invite Dr. Kamar to commence the special lecture for this uh, afternoon session. Thank you, Professor. Over to you. Thank you very much, uh, Dietri, for your <clears throat> introduction and to Professor Chaturvedi, who has always been so affectionate and kind to me. And I've been lucky and fortunate and privileged to have known him and to have been in his circle for a long time for giving me this opportunity. Thank you very much, Chaturvedi, sir. I congratulate you, uh, but then there are so many occasions and events for which you need to be congratulated, but I congratulate you for taking this initiative for your own teachers, faculty from the two campuses and to make them aware and sensitize about the profession that they have chosen and the discipline to which that they belong to, to know that what future lies ahead and how to cope with and be ready to face the challenges. Uh, you have chosen a very futuristic topic that developing a roadmap for future higher education. Prior to December 2019, we had never imagined that we will be faced with such a crisis, such an uncertainty in our lives. And during those days, it was far more easier to predict and to see, at least in a linear way, as to where we are headed. But ever since Corona impacted all of us, in the first wave, marginally, but in the second wave, so colossally, 
that there is hardly a friend whom I talk to, whom I speak to, who had not had a tragedy in and around his family. And then for the first time in our life, and maybe after 1918 to 1920, we are experiencing with a dilemma. Our discipline, management discipline is always dealing with managerial dilemma and to take action to solve those dilemma. We had always believed that there is not a single best way of doing things. And we always knew that there are risk and cost and benefit associated with every decision that management professional takes. But we had never thought that we have to come across with the managerial dilemma, with the leadership dilemma, where we have to choose between life and livelihood. And obviously, the life is more valuable, more important, and therefore, not only in our country, but the world as a whole, chose to protect the life in the hope that if people are alive, hale, hearty, the livelihood would be restored later. At that time, we had thought that perhaps it's going to be a temporary phenomenon, but I think for the past 15 months or so, the higher education campuses are closed. Uh, we never thought that universities and academic institutions would ever shut their doors for their teachers and students and would ask them to go home. But we had no option but to do this. We all also learned to adopt new ways. Technology enthusiasts, or you could call as technology touts, had always been saying that future of higher education is in technology. And then these brick and mortar universities uh, would have a very short life. And uh, we have always been taking a very skeptic view that technology could be a good tool to improve quality and to promote excellence, but it would never substitute the in-person face-to-face interaction. I recall Professor Yashpal when he was working in the Yashpal committee saying that there is something about education which you can say that it is kind of contact sports or touch sports. So you can play maybe basketball with the click of mouse and the keyboard on your computer, but you will not get that thrill and feel when you actually play basketball or hockey or kabaddi or when you are actually on the ground in the field and you are fighting, quarreling, passing, uh, ditching. So education is one such activity. So we are still hopeful. Uh, my analysis tells me that as soon as things would be normal, universities would return back to where they were in the same mode in which they were with marginal adoption of technology and some blended learning. And why I'm saying so that the invent and advent of technology has never substituted teaching learning process the way we have known it ever since we invented university kind of an institution. Just on a uh, side, uh, for 300 years, the plague used to hit Europe, UK, even United States, uh, off and on. And every time the plague would hit a campus, the student and teacher would leave their campuses and would take refuge in the manor houses or havelis of the Jagirdars. In fact, what the most productive time for Newton when he did best researches, seminal work, was one such occasion when his university was closed and he took refuge in a manor house. But interestingly, though it happened over a period of 300 years several times, but as soon as the plague was controlled, none of those manor houses could remain as a teaching or research academy or a scholar's academy, the campuses came back to normal and that is my feeling that this will happen here. Closer home in India, uh, 
if you compare the census of 1911 with 1921 the spanish flu had affected us so much that our population has actually declined during these two census period but number of universities during these two census period has gone up and interestingly the universities which were established post spanish flu were in no way different than the universities that existed before in their teacher in their educational processes and so on so this was the background so it is in this background that the national education policy added one more uncertainty but then a lot of positive hope kind of a situation that it also brought in so today what i'll do is that maybe in some six seven slides i'll present some of the points of the national education policy some of the features of the national education policy that have the potential to impact all higher education but also the management education and when i am making this presentation kindly read this in the perspective of the management education that we know in our country and after that we shall uh, uh, take uh, uh, i'll take you through uh, some of the uh, uh, slides uh, just a second there is some disturbance okay uh about some of the features of the management education that has been there at least since 1995 and the kind of situation as it is there uh in 2018 and 19 and then i will leave the conclusion to be drawn by the participants who are all very intelligent very bright young and experienced both uh, faculty members uh so the implication would be obvious to you perhaps uh, i may not have to uh, elaborate on this but in the course of discussion those implications would also come so taking to the first slide which is already displayed uh, uh national education policy took almost 7 years to make and it was announced on 29th july 2020 and therefore we are just about 45 days ahead of the first anniversary of the national education policy and during this one year people have been interpreting reading and partially in a piecemeal manner implementing some part of the education policy with which you are all familiar with i'll not burden you with the whole policy document because i'm sure that most of you must have read it but the critical point so one laudable goal uh, that uh, the national education policy has set for itself that it wants to make india's higher education second to none in the world uh that is the goal although a time frame has not been provided but in any case we are the single largest system of higher education found anywhere in the world with close to 50000 higher educational institutions no other country has a parallel to india so we are already second to none as far as the number of institutions are concerned in terms of enrollment uh, close to 40 million we are presently second to only china but very soon we are likely to overtake china and we are likely to become uh, second to none or the best system as far as the enrollment is concerned so on these two parameter irrespective of the present policy prescription we would have become second to none but i am very sure that when policy mentioned this that we want 
in education system second to none they are talking about quality and that is one dimension and the excellence is one dimension where we are lagging very very far behind the second more tangible goal that it has set up is that they want to take the ger gross enrollment ratio or percentage of people uh, in higher education of the age group 18 to 24 to 50% presently it is close to about 30% or rather 25.7% or so it means in the next 14 years the policy hopes to double the enrollment in higher education these are the two numerical goals in terms of the expansion and i believe in terms of quality and then higher education and the national education policy uh, provides focus on reforming the higher education system and some of these reforms are is structural systematic and i would like to present in a few slide that what are these structural changes that have been suggested in higher education may i get the next slide please so uh, to begin with i'll say that the policy speaks about restructuring the higher educational institutions uh and what are some of the major institutional restructuring that may have uh, uh impact on management education both positive and as well as some challenging that this policy is prescribing that we shall do away with the affiliation system this is one area which we have been saying and many time it was discussed that affiliation system reminds us of the colonial past that was a british legacy prior to the arrival of the british there were no affiliation system the gurukul the madrasas the ashrams they all had their teachers who were entitled to frame the curricula head of the teacher was the supervisor and normally would have the word in fact uh, there will not be any structured duration of the program the teacher or the ustad or the guru would decide based on the progress of the student that he has learned i'm using he and at that time he did not include she because most of those uh, education was limited to only men but then decided that when is education complete since 18th century we had this affiliation system that colleges would teach but would not prescribe the syllabus would not conduct examinations examination and the syllabus and the evaluation would be done by external agencies so when we began it was the university of london which will set the paper and the syllabus which will be shipped to india to bombay and calcutta port and madras port a student would take those examination and those people would evaluate since independence the number of the institutions affiliated to limited number of universities have gone up and they are adversely affecting higher education in a wide variety of ways uh, so like uh, even best colleges have to come down to a common denominator to accept the university's dictum so they are not able to innovate they are not able to uh, experiment and the university system itself is burdened by the affiliation burden and many of them have become examination conducting body so much so that the leadership of these universities if you ask them that what are your accomplishment during your tenure one of the major accomplishment that they will show is that they have been able to conduct examination on time without unfair means and been able to declare the result in time even despite that you will come to know that convocations have not been held for the past 10 years or 20 years so this policy says that we will do away with affiliation system institutions would award degrees in their own names 
then there would be three categories of institutions the research universities primarily focused on research and now the nirf ranking has included one category of the research universities that those institutions which have uh, 5000 plus publication in the web of science would be regarded as uh, research universities the uh, teaching universities are those which will primarily focus on uh, teaching job oriented uh, but then will also have research some research as part of their mandate and then all other distinction of the affiliated colleges and the stand alone institution would disappear and dissolve and they will all be labeled as autonomous higher educational institutions so bimtech will not have to worry about or bimtech kind of institution will not have to worry about uh, the uh, being classified as a is stand alone institution and being dealt by uh, different uh, kinds of dispensation uh, treated separately and differently than a college than a university the third thing which this uh, policy talks about it which would become a challenge for management education that they want institutions to be resized and they want to upscale the enrollment of higher educational institutions india is one such country where we have a large number of higher educational institution which on an average are of very small size so the average enrollment per college would work out to around 600 although there are colleges which have enrollment as high as 10000 an average enrollment in universities would work out to about 3000 although there are universities which may have students uh, in excess of about a lakh or so sometime more than that now if individual institution it means there is a huge uh, uh, disparity and skewness in the size of the institutions but bulk of the institutions are of very small size and in which all these stand alone management institutions and even if they are in the form of an affiliated mba program or even in the university system the enrollment is low uh, on per student basis so the challenge is to take the enrollment to say a level of about 3000 that would be possible by adding more sections but then perhaps the policy expects and which is mentioned here is that they want all higher educational institutions to be multidisciplinary uh, so they expect institutions not to be a kind of mono disciplinary uh, should have a wide variety of disciplines should have science technology liberal arts humanities all put together because when i'll come to program restructuring i'll talk about that they expect all students to be exposed to a wide variety of courses uh, in a form of a bouquet so they want all higher education to be multidisciplinary combine these third point and the fourth point and the challenge for management education becomes bigger so like say stand alone institutions management program by nature are interdisciplinary conventionally across the world in fact one of the argument to separate management education from economics and commerce was that here in the school of business or in the faculties of management we will need people from sociology history language psychology and in fact most of the theories and the models that we teach to our students they hardly came out of the business school but they came from the parent discipline to which teachers in business school belong to so the game theory did not come from business schools the neural network did not come from business school and so on you can cite a number of example whatever is discipline uh, most of the theories in the organizational behavior and the motivation and the job satisfaction they all came from behavioral sciences most from econo- finance came from either mathematics or economics background so management education by nature is multidisciplinary people are taught many disciplines 
But here they are talking about that no, as in addition to what you prescribe to your MBA program or PGDM program, give option to your student to also study whatever they want to study from across the institution and for which you need to have a wide variety of discipline on campus. If alone you cannot do it, form cluster. So that is a cluster approach that they are talking about. So the first preference is become multidisciplinary. Second preference is become part of a cluster. And then they are saying, which I think people are welcoming, but I don't see any fundamental change that all higher educational institutions to be managed by a self-governing board. So all decisions are to be taken by the board themselves, so an empowered board. I think most of the private institutions have been following this practice. Most of the public institutions were not, including uh, the most prominent and eminent management institutes like IAMS, uh, where the government used to have a lot of say in their governing boards and appointment of the chairperson and many power relating to the institute vested outside the board. But now they are saying that they will all be done through a governing board. On a second thought, however, what they have said is that it will be linked to your accreditation status and your excellence status. Meaning this self-governing board would be available only to those who are rated high, who are perceived excellent. So, and not to all. And in fact, earlier when we had begun our modern higher education in our country, all universities had an autonomous self-governing board their academic council, executive council, syndicates, senates, they were all powerful to take all decisions. But gradually in the name of checking misuse and for promoting quality, these powers were taken over or these powers were subscribed by the guidelines and the circulars and the regulations issued by various regulatory bodies and the governments. So here they seem to be giving power, but then again, taking it back in the form of redefining them in terms of that you will get this power only if you are excellent. Many people globally would argue that freedom and autonomy is a necessary condition for attaining excellence because your innovation and experiment comes only when you have a freedom to experiment. So it is like a cash 22 chicken and egg kind of a story that you don't get autonomy and therefore you don't become excellent. And since you don't become excellent and therefore you can't have a self-governing board. Can I have the next slide, please? Now coming to program restructuring. So after institutional restructuring is the that each program, so like MBA is a program. Uh, BSc is a program, MSc is a program, so they want these programs to be restructured. So the first restructuring is about a flexible curricular framework with wider choices and based on what uh, uh, I came to know in Yale University that they have a policy at the undergraduate level that every student who take admissions has the freedom to swim across the pool, which is Yale. So for two years, he swims across, sometimes takes courses from X department and Y department. And then in this process of two years, the student discovers herself or himself, finds his passion and finds his way, and then decides in which discipline he must immerse. And therefore, then he dives deeper into those disciplines. So the policy does not use these words, but I think when they are saying that flexible curricular framework, wider choices, it means they want a student to swim across and they want a student to dive deep. Assumption is that a student would know uh, what is best for them and the teachers would be a marginal 
गाइड और ए फैसिलिटेटर इन दैट प्रोसेस एंड द फाइनल से वुड बी दैट ऑफ स्टूडेंट्स सैडली द रियालिटी ऑफ वेरियस इकोनमीज एंड कंट्रीज आर दैट इफ यू आर अ रिच कंट्री इफ यू आर अ फुल एम्प्लॉयमेंट कंट्री इफ यू आर ए थर्ड और फोर्थ जनरेशन लर्नर जो पेरेंट्स एंड ग्रैंड पेरेंट्स एंड ग्रैंड ग्रैंड पेरेंट्स हैव ऑल बीन एजुकेटेड then in your higher education you follow your passion on a lighter side i think uh, somebody once said that when khushwan singh uh, went to london to oxford and came back after completing his education somebody asked his father ke beta kya pass karke aaya hai और खुशवंत सिंह के फादर ने कहा कि ये तो पता नहीं क्या पास करके आया है लेकिन टाइम बहुत पास करके आया है तो व्हेन यू हैव द अफोर्डेबिलिटी व्हेन योर सर्कमस्टांसिस परमिट देन यू परसू योर पैशन एंड देन यू एक्सपेरिमेंट यू डाइव दी बट इफ यू आर एन इकोनॉमी व्हिच इज मोस्ट ऑफ दी स्टूडेंट आर फर्स्ट जनरेशन लर्नर they come from the poorer economic background they want to quickly complete their education and join job markets and earn and support their parents and add to the their livelihood then people pursue career so wherever they see opportunities they pursue those kind of education irrespective of where their passion lies so if somebody is passionate about history but sees job opportunities in engineering and technology and management he would want to pursue these engineering and management we are seeing this phenomena phenomenally in our country but we are saying that it is a peer pressure no it's not peer pressure it is the pressure of the circumstances in the same breath the policy talks about blended learning giving opportunity to students to learn anywhere any time now the recent uh, guidelines that is being circulated i'm very sure that professor chaturvedi must be occupied in sending his response or response of the association to which he is the coach uh, about the blended learning where it is proposed that up to 40% courses the student can take outside their institution through any mooc platform or swayam etc they are also talking about uh, that we are doing this to provide a seamless mobility so that there is no barrier so there is an automatic qualification recognition and now they have gone an extent beyond and they are saying that if students are free to go on accumulating credits from anywhere that they want to and they can deposit this credits to a bank created or to a kind of depository that the government would create they are calling it as abc academic bank of credits so they would go on accumulating credits and depositing those credits in a depository and then after some time when they have accumulated enough credit they will come to a university and say that i already know i have passed these courses you evaluate and assess these courses and decide that i have become mba from your institution or i have become a master of science or an mbbs of course the medical commission has denied this has declined this opportunity but for others humanities social sciences management education it's valid so they are exploring this possibility in fact in one of the piece that i wrote for a book that came out of amsterdam Uh, somebody was working on uh, covid and its impact and they wanted to be futuristic so i built upon this and i said that if people can go on accumulating credits from say khan academy from youtube a number of lectures and juda city udemy uh, coursera from some institutions and accumulate those credits so why is there a need for a university you can have a higher education qualification authority whose job would be to assess and evaluate your qualification and know your worth so the universities would not be needed universities can all go online and then why you should have 
a national higher education qualification authority because it would act as a barrier. So you set up a universal higher education qualification authority so that there is one common entity on the pattern of the United Nations uh, anywhere in the world where these qualifications could be recognized, etc. So these are the possibilities. They are throwing up challenges about the quality. They are throwing up possibilities of various kinds, but we are into untested water. We do not know the consequences of these things because in no other country we have these kinds of systems and practices to this extent. They are talking about change in the duration. So now the UG program could be of three years or four years, no issues. Even presently, we have engineering programs of four years, some of the tourism and travel degree program of four years. But most of the programs have been three years. But then they are saying that the PG program would be of one year if you have done four years of bachelor. And it will be of two years if you have done three years of bachelor's. So I think uh, we, Professor Chaturvedi, and all your colleagues should sit down that what do we do in management education? Should our MBA program or PGDM program remain of two years? Because we admit some students who are engineering background and who have done four years of undergraduate. What if they demand that they be given their MBA in one year degree? Which curricula do you compromise? What do you give up? Or if you think that they can learn faster, then the three-year people would also demand that, okay, if in Europe, in INSEAD, you can get an MBA in one year, why not we in India from BIMTEC or Jamia Millia Islamia or from these institutions? Interesting part is that this choice of the duration has been left to higher educational institution. But again, this power has been circumscribed, has been redefined by the status of the higher educational institution in terms of the ranking and accreditation. Next slide, please. And then finally, they are proposing to restructure the regulatory framework of higher education in the country. They want to end multiplicity. And this every commission and every committee has been in suggesting ever since the National Knowledge Commission gave its report in 2007. Jashpal committee did not agree with the National Knowledge Commission, but then ended up suggesting that multiple regulatory bodies need to be done away with. They all said single regulatory body. They all used different names. But now, this policy that has been approved says that there would be a single regulatory body called Higher Education Regulatory Council. Of course, when the draft report came in 2019, the medical and the legal education had their objections. And in the final policy, they said that with the exception of medical and agriculture education. And for medical now, rather than having a single regulator, what we have done is that there is one regulator for allopathy, there is one regulator for homeopathy, there is one regulator for Ayush. So for each branch of medical education, there is a separate regulator. So in case of medical education, that argument of a multiplicity being a barrier has not been yielded to. But in case of the rest, I think this policy has said, but I think it's still the Bar Council and the Council of the Architecture. Okay, they are sir, still. I'm sorry for the interruption, but uh, in the interest of time and with the great to be able to interact with you, and also that we'll be joined by our next uh, external speaker, may I uh, request you uh, to uh, kindly, you know, have wrap it up in another 10 minutes so that we have a chance to interact with you. Oh, oh. so I think you are Thank all familiar. Yes, it, it will have a four uh, verticals. One vertical would be for to regulate higher education and the regulator, uh, another vertical to 
recognize agencies to aggregated institutions and then the general education council which will have as member all other existing professional and the regulatory bodies like aict etc who become a standard setting bodies so aict which was presently a regulator or facilitator for higher education would no more be there uh, if the policy is translated and if the higher education research commission uh, higher education regulatory commission come into place um uh, that we thank you for pointing this out i was working on uh, uh, framework that okay i'll have one and a half hour so i'll try to finish in 10 hours just to show something so these are all the kind of changes that the policy talks about and we can know the implications for management education for each one of them uh, another slide please this is about reforming the fund and the funding of higher education so they are saying no distinction between public and private every institution shall have freedom to fix their fees but no profit no surplus to be made all institutions to increase their cost recovery and user charges perhaps that is more applicable to public institutions since education would become expensive so liberal scholarship is to be given to students and in all probability this liberal scholarship has to come from cross subsidization rather than coming in the form of any grant etc but again the public funding would be linked to outcome and excellence that is again based on your accreditation and your ranking in the framework so if you are rated high you will have access to more funds but if you are rated low you will not have a fund uh, and therefore this again puts us to the same kind of situation that you need funds to improve your infrastructure and the human and the physical one only then you can attain excellence but if you don't have excellence you will not get money next slide please now a uh, present situation of the management education in our country is characterized by a wide variety of the institutions so there is one category how do i name them i do not mean to demean any institution but i think i find one category of institution which are free birds uh, which you can also call as foot loose whatever they want they can do and these include institutions of national importance so nits iits ics isc and some of the exclusive management schools they neither require any approval nor uh, they are subject to accreditation at the moment they themselves are the decision makers in their own right so this is one category so are the universities central state and private they are not uh also required to obtain approval of any regulatory body since they are created by law therefore they are permitted to take their academic decisions and deemed universities have been a kind of flip flop sometime brought under aic sometime kept outside uh, so but is still by and large they take decisions then they are caged or the tamed kind of an institution which have to follow the regulatory dictum these includes the affiliated colleges so multiple regulation applies to them they are part of the university so the university systems of affiliation they are in the state and therefore the state education department for technical education they have to take permission from the aict so they have to follow these regulations and then the stand alone institutions also are on their sides and then there are some unauthorized and illegal institution i would not like to name any their numbers are also not known some efforts were made to find out and that number ranges from 600 to any number but then the fact is that they exist now all of them would be some of them would find the education policy beneficial because it will provide them legitimacy and earlier problem that they were experiencing would not be experienced now but for some there would be some kind of a situation so say for example a bimtech kind of institute whatever research you do how or an iim for that purpose 
how do you get recognized as a research institution because your faculty size or enrollment size would not enable you would not entitle you to claim that then there are a few slides uh, uh next uh, next slide please anyway these uh, uh, in the interest of time and i think you will be uh, uh i think this is uh, very obvious that uh, these different types of management programs are also organized in a wide variety of way sometimes they are a center sometimes they are a department sometimes it's a department in the faculty of commerce or business or management or sometime an independent school of business and management or sometime a whole institute exclusively devoted to business educations like iams or similarly amongst the uh, uh, regulated ones uh, tightly regulated ones to have these many wide varieties i think the next slides next 5 6 slides uh people can read them these are the data in one slide i have shown the growth uh, of management education in terms of the institutions and programs over the past 25 years or so and what we are seeing is that while numerically we are rising qualitatively we are declining our student teacher ratio is 1 is to 16 as of now our number of program per institutions have actually declined so there are not many institutions which have multiple programs offered approved intake has gone up tremendously though in between it has gone up further but many institutions were closed down and the now the number in 2019 is about 3 lakh 42000 is the kind of intake private sector plays a major role up to 92% and the share of the private sector has been going up next slide please quickly uh now are there any program which we can say are better than the other unfortunately we do not find any evidence of that so we argued that pg dbm programs on an average are better than the mba program because of the affiliation but what we find is that most institutions have not been able to invest in the quality in terms of teachers and therefore capacity utilization of even in the pg dbm program is only 50% 53% as compared to that in mba program it is as high as 65% uh so but anyway these differences are very marginal we can't say that mba is more uh, suited than pg dbm or vice versa but still the mba degree rule the roost in terms of sheer number and on an average the faculty size per program is also marginally better than the pgdm program and mind you i am sharing average statistics next please now the data that aict reports which is presented here is only a half truth and part of the story for example we do not know anything about the management program which are run by iits and its icels and iims no data available for central universities out of 47 central universities data for only 10 is available for state universities only 50 have taken out of 400 similarly private universities only 44 have taken it means whatever data is available to us they are very partial data they do not tell us the whole story but i think some researchers should come forward uh, to do further research in these areas next slide please quickly now the same point across government and government aided institutions self trust private institutions university teaching departments is there any evidence that one is better than others it appears that the university teaching departments at least in 2018 19 did marginally better in terms of capacity utilization even their placement statistics is not way behind 
placement in terms of the number of student placed i'm not talking about quality of the placement uh as compared to private self financed and the government or the government aided institutions uh so next slide please now in terms of the ranking with which you are all familiar and most of the institution these days are busy filling up forms etc but you see they started publishing separate ranking for management education last time 2019 ranking they could not find even 100 business schools to be ranked amongst the top 100 they had to stop the limit to 75th and if you look at the composite score i mean the idea is that if out of 3800 institutions and programs if you choose 100 or 75 there shall be neck to neck competition but sadly the difference between the top most and the 75th is huge even between the top and the 10th top is huge not only in terms of the composite score but all other parameters of higher education it means we have to address this issue of the quality significantly merely ranking as a mirror to the institution would not serve the purpose we need to do something significant so that the 75th one could also move the ladder up to become 50th 20th 10th etc the last very last slide i think uh, next one this is my favorite the challenge of higher education in all branch of higher education is in india is still expansion we are a young nation the population in the age group which will enter into higher education is enormous we need to create capacity to accommodate them merely creating capacity would not be sufficient so expansion would not be sufficient we need to do something proactively to make higher education affordable and accessible by all so equity and then these two will not serve a purpose even if we educate 100% unless we strive for excellence in higher education so this triple e has been a challenge is a challenge would remain a challenge there are only three solutions we need to invest significantly in higher education so fund we need to have quality teachers in large number across all disciplines most of the management institutes are just operating at the aict approval guideline norms which is not going to bring in uh, quality and excellence so we need to have more investment in teachers uh, not only in terms of numbers but also in terms of their qualification and their commitment and their dedication and then freedom uh, that is the autonomy freedom not to do whatever these institutions want to do but freedom to do what they are expected to do so the challenge of 3e can be overcome by infusing these 3f and then the quality would go up so i'll stop here thank you very much thank you so much professor and i can already see uh, my director and dean sir clapping these are the occasions where we miss out on the ovation and uh, the pleasure of interacting with you in person which i still remember back uh, during my induction so it is indeed in insightful to know about uh, the objective targets of the nep and its intent of restructuring uh, higher education institutions uh, as well as the changes in product uh, program design so uh, our morning started with an interesting analogy of b schools and soaps by dr pp mathur and now we have the analogy of free birds and also the footloose and also the caged so we see a lot of uh, caste discrimination that is here but i am sure uh, we are in safe hands and we'll sail through this so uh, i again my sincere apologies for the paucity of the time as we'll be joined by another external uh, expert and uh, may i uh, uh, thank you on behalf of uh, billa institute of management technology for being there with us 
and professor uh, the fraternity as a whole is immensely benefited by your wisdom uh, and for having you with us as a thought leader and thank you for uh, taking out your time to share your views and experience and also the quantitative figures that uh, was presented to us it gives us a lucid picture and uh, 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 while we hope that we have a chance of interaction but uh, we are hard pressed against time and uh, thank you so much we close our first lecture session with some very insightful takeaways and i request my fraternity members uh, to stay logged in and we hope to have dr kumar with us uh, in near future as soon as we are over with the covid scenario thank you so much professor thank you datri and thank you professor chaturvedi um, uh, uh, it was a pleasure it was a privilege to be with you and i'm happy that i could share and the technology did not fail me and the electricity <laughs> did not fail me and uh, my apologies to all participants i think i was working on a time frame of one and a half hours and i thought that there would be half an hour left but then it was a one hour session so my apologies maybe if they want uh, i am i offer to have interaction with your teacher uh, no screen attached professor chaturvedi just a day uh, of uh, free uh, flow interaction thank you very much will be a pleasure sir you are always very nice and kind to bimtech and we shall we shall definitely have another opportunity thank you thank you sir thank you very much